Thank you, David. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, my talk is about the challenges of feeding Europe and the world in 2050. By that time, the world population would have, will have increased by two to three billion inhabitants of, before just stabilizing at that level. This additional people to feed is not, in fact, the main challenge uh, for feeding the world. The main challenge is related to the effect modern agriculture already today has on the environment. You probably already heard about... Is it okay? Oh, okay. Uh, you, you heard about the planetary limits already. Uh, the, these are threshold value of some indicators of human activity beyond which the habitability of the Earth is compromised. And uh, six over nine of these planetary limits, as defined by Rockström, are already crossed. And modern agriculture have a big part in this crossing. Agriculture is producing one third about of the greenhouse gases. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so it's a big responsible of uh, climate change. Agriculture is responsible for most of the loss of biodiversity. And agriculture also is responsible for a complete overhaul of some nutrient cycling, mainly the nitrogen cycling. And I, I just want to insist a little bit on uh, this aspect. Nitrogen, as you know, is, or not, <laughs> uh, is the uh, main constituent of proteins and nucleic acid, which are important components of living organisms. Uh, and the, the reactive forms of nitrogen available to autotrophic organism plants for building up these proteins and amino acids and uh, nucleic acids are not very abundant on the planet. Yet nitrogen, as you know certainly, <laughs> is very abundant on the planet, but under a uh, non-reactive, an inert form. It is the N2, the gaseous atmospheric nitrogen, uh, which compose, which makes of, uh, which compose 80% uh, of our atmosphere. So, we, in fact, as living organisms, we are, we are really swimming in an ocean of nitrogen, of denitrogen. But this denitrogen is not available for organisms. Uh, that, that's a paradox of uh, nitrogen, a very abundant uh, element, which is very rare under a reactive form, available to organisms, <coughs> yet uh, absolutely necessary. So, this means that the process of atmospheric denitrogen fixation, that is, the process of converting inert nitrogen from the atmosphere into reactive forms usable by plants, nitrate, ammonia. This process of nitrogen fixing is very important. It is key because it is driving, it is controlling the rate of the biogenic cycle of nitrogen uh, derived by organisms. Now, there are two processes able to fix denitrogen and to convert it into reactive nitrogen forms. The first one is symbiotic nitrogen fixation. Some, a few organisms, bacteria in fact, are able, they, they have the enzymes necessary to convert atmospheric nitrogen, denitrogen, into proteins directly. But this is a very costly uh, process requiring lots of energy in the form of uh, sugar, for instance. So some of these bacteria are free living in the soil, but most of, the, of them 
are uh, exist in a symbiosis with certain plants, legumes plant, legumes like lentils, uh, beans, uh, soybean, or forage legumes like clover, alfalfa, and other. Or there are also trees able to have this kind of symbiosis with nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Uh, in this symbiosis, the plant is providing sugar that he, he pro it produces from photosynthesis. And in exchange, the bacteria receiving this sugar is fixing nitrogen, giving some reactive nitrogen to the plant. And the remains of this plant, when decomposing in the soil, are providing also nitrogen for other plants uh, not having this kind of symbiosis with bacteria. So you, you see, legume, legumes, plant have a key role in the nitrogen cycle, and a key role in providing nitrogen to uh, the ecosystem, the natural ecosystem. That's one process. The other process is an industrial one. It has been invented uh, by the, at the beginning of the 19th century by Karl Bosch uh, and Fritz Haber. Uh, they they, they developed the process of heating under very high temperature and very high pressure, a mix of air, denitrogen mainly, with hydrogen produced from, now it is produced from uh, natural gas, at that time it was produced from coal. Uh, and this mix produce, convert into ammonia, a reactive form of nitrogen. This process requires lots of energy also, lots of energy f from fossil fuels, either coal or natural gas. It was first used for producing explosives. I did. This, it was used in large amounts in the First World War. Uh, then, after the world, after the wars, in fact, it was used massively for producing fertilizer. That is, uh, forms of reactive nitrogen that men put on the field to promote the growth of plants making them available, lots of reactive nitrogen. The problem is that this process of putting fertilizers, synthetic industrial fertilizer, on uh, the field uh, become massive. And in fact, today, we are, man, uh, you, you man, is uh, bringing reactive forms of nitrogen at a rate which equal or even is over the rate at which natural processes produce, introduce reactive nitrogen. So we have doubled the rate of circulation of nitrogen in the biogenic cycle. That's for increasing agricultural production, okay? But the problem is that most, about half of the fertilizer, the nitrogen fertilizer introduced, put on the soil, is lost instead of being taken up by plants and converted in food. Indeed, nitrogen, reactive nitrogen, and particularly nitrate, are very uh, mobile forms. Uh, they are easily volatilized under the form of ammonia or under the form of nitrous oxide. Uh, ammonia is generating uh, strong atmospheric pollution. Nitrous oxide is a uh, greenhouse gas contributing to global warming. Uh, losses to the atmosphere, losses also to the hydrosphere, because nitrate, another reactive form uh, of nitrogen, is easily leached when a rain is uh, infiltrating through the soil profile. Nitrate contaminates uh, aquifers, contaminates 
a river contaminates coastal zones, producing eutrophication, loss of biodiversity, <laughs> loss of potability of the water, the freshwater resources. So you see this problem of nitrogen losses associated with the use of uh, synthetic fertilizer is a major issue for the environment. So uh, I hope I convinced you that nitrogen is at the earth of this problematic of feeding the world. Because losses resulting from the use of fertilizer uh, are very important and responsible for, for crossing planetary limits. Because nitrogen is nevertheless a major limiting factor controlling vegetal growth and agricultural production. In fact, soil inputs of nitrogen the inputs of nitrogen to the soil uh, determines the crop yield in most agricultural systems. And there is a third reason. Nitrogen, under the form of protein, is also the basis of our food. You, you probably or not <laughs> know that uh, uh, each uh, adult human needs about 2,500 kilocalories per day. But that depends a lot on the physical activity he is experiencing. But don't forget that whatever the, activi the, the physical activity, each adult needs also about 60 gram protein in his diet. That's not for energy requirement. Energy requirement can be uh, ensured by lipids and glucids. But proteins are normally not used for energy purposes. It is used for tissue buildup and renewal. And under a basic physiological level of about 60 grams of proteins, that makes 10 grams of nitrogen, that makes 3.6 kilogram nitrogen per year. Try to remember this figure. Uh, Below this level, sorry, below this level, uh, you cannot renew your tissue and, uh, okay, you cannot live below this threshold. So, providing at least 3.6 kilogram nitrogen per capita per year to the whole population uh, is the condition of uh, food security. Okay, so you see these three reasons explain that the rest of my talk in fact, the beginning was also, uh, it was also the case in the beginning. There, uh, all my talk will be about nitrogen, in fact, <laughs> because of this. And uh, we will use nitrogen as a unified metric for analyzing the flow of material to the different compartments of agro-food systems. This method is called the graphs approach, graphs for generalized representation of agro-food system a representation of agro-food system through the flow of nitrogen uh, from uh, cropland to livestock to, uh, to the human the eaters, the human being, uh, and their diet. Let me apply this approach to the case of the European agro-food system, the current uh, European agro-food system. <laughs> Maybe I can put this elsewhere. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, the European population, 530 million inhabitants, is eating about 5.7 kilogram nitrogen per capita per year. You, you see that's much over the minimum requirement. Okay, that's, that's good. Uh, about 65% of this total amount of proteins taken in by the population is under the form of animal-based food, meat, milk and fish and eggs. The rest, about 35%, is under the form of vegetal-based 
proteins. There are proteins in cereals, in, uh, uh, in grain legumes, uh, in vegetables and fruits. Okay, there are some there. Okay, the vegetal based proteins are produced, of course, by. Yeah. What happens? Ah, okay. Uh, by crop growth, by, by the harvest of crop land. But you see, the harvest of crop land uh, is much more than the needs of vegetal, po uh, of vegetal protein uh, population. Most, of a, a large amount is exported out of Europe, out of the frontiers of Europe, to the rest of the world. That's okay. And, in fact, two-thirds of the harvest of crop plants in Europe is dedicated to feeding livestock. Livestock, which is producing the animal-based proteins consumed by the population. All the figures here are in teragram nitrogen, that is, million tons of nitrogen per year, just to, to give you uh, the units of these figures. Uh, so you see again that the production of edible protein from, from livestock is uh, used mainly by the population, but some uh, excedents are also exported to the rest of the world. Now, if you look at how livestock is fed, you see indeed that it, this livestock eats two-thirds of cropland production, also grazed some grass from the grasslands in Europe, and that's not enough. Uh, livestock also eat a flux of 3 million tons nitrogen imported from outside Europe. That's mainly soybean and soybean cakes from South America. That's the biggest part of, of protein, of feed protein imported uh, from outside Europe. Now, to complete this picture, you have to see how cropland and grasslands are fertilized. What is fertilization? Fertilization is, is the process of uh, compensating, restituting to soils the amount of nitrogen which has been extracted, which has been uh, exported from the soil through the harvest or the grazing. Okay? Uh, if you don't compensate for this export, your soil will and we will uh, be devoted, uh, after some years, will be devoted of nitrates and the uh, continuation of the, pro of the agricultural productivity would be impossible. So fertilization is there to compensate for this export. For this export and for the losses occurring from the soil. Well, this fertilization happens from different processes. First of all, uh, livestock manure recycling, most of uh, the, the nitrogen ingested by livestock is not converted into edible protein, but is lost, lost to the atmosphere part, but uh, lost in manure. This manure is not lost, in fact, it is applied on cropland and on grasslands to compensate, to partly compensate for this export. That's part of the, fer the fertilization process. But that's not enough because of the losses. So, new sources of nitrogen have to come uh, to help this fertilization. And you see that, okay, symbiotic fi fixation play a little role. Also, the uh, atmospheric deposition, there, there is some, some nitrogen in the rain, but that's, that's marginal. Most of the fertilization is through uh, the application of synthetic fertilization. And you see that, that this is a huge amount of nitrogen, which is not produced so much in Europe. Why? Because, because producing nitrogen fertilizer requires huge amount of uh, fossil fuels, uh, of fossil energy uh, that Europe don't have, except in Norway. Norway is producing a little, uh, small amount of fertilizer. But most of the uh, fertilizer used in Europe are imported from countries having large amounts of, of energy, 
Russia? Uh, and the, the second one is uh, uh, not Algeria, but Tunisia. No, well, Algeria, sorry, sorry, Algeria. Uh, so, okay, uh, India also is a third importer of synthetic fertilizer. So you see the level of dependence uh, that the system has as in terms of uh, need for import of synthetic fertilizer. Okay, so this is the, the picture as a whole European level. Just let me see how this uh, looks when we apply the same method to describe the agro-food system at regional level. That's interesting because what, you, what we see here is that there is a tremendous specialization of a territorial agro-food system. In some region, like uh, okay, all the Paris Basin, most areas in uh, Central Europe, uh, there is a big specialization into cereal production. Systems which are producing lots of cereal, mainly for export, depending on very important imports of synthetic fertilizer. Other regions like Brittany in France, uh, all the, the north of Europe, Belgium, uh, Belgium uh, Netherlands, uh, part of Dan Denmark, uh, some region in, in Spain also, are specialized in livestock farming. The livestock is very important. Uh, it is, it is not fed mainly by croplands, by, by feed produced on cropland, but mostly dependent on import, massive import of uh, feed from outside Europe, uh, thus producing enormous excess of manure applied on croplands and uh, major uh, losses of nitrogen at that level. So you see this level of specialization which, which is very typical of modern agriculture. And which is also the cause of the impossibility of closing the nitrogen cycle, of uh, using, using uh, effic efficiently the amount of manure produced by livestock, which then requires much more uh, nitrogen fertilizer, synthetic fertilizer. Okay, so uh, let, let me come back to the, the whole picture, the scale of Europe. What you see also is that, as I said, the system is exporting large amounts of cereals and animal products to the rest of the world. But it is importing feed at a rate which is still higher than uh, this export. So Europe is certainly, well, he, we, we saw that Europe is dependent on the rest of the world for uh, synthetic fertilizer production, but Europe is also strongly dependent on the rest of the world for protein uh, import. Uh, contrarily to what the economist says, <laughs> Europe is not feeding the world. Europe is dependent on the rest of the world for feeding its population through this import of massive amounts of feed from outside. Okay? So the picture is quite different according to, uh, to uh, according if you see the things in terms of nitrogen, what a biogeochemist like me uh, uh, do, uh, while, uh, or, or if you look at uh, euros or dollars. And the picture is quite different, of course. Okay, so um, it's not a surprise that Europe is exchanging so much food material, agricultural commodities with the rest of the world. Because at the world level, you can see this enormous importance of the trade of agricultural com uh, commodities. Here you have the net exchange of proteins among two region, two, 12 regions of the world. And you see that, uh, well, th these exchanges are extremely important. In fact, international trade concerns 
uh, more than 30% of the global agricultural production of proteins. That's a, a, a very big part. Uh, and you see that some countries are specialized, are, are producing excedents of proteins and are feeding uh, other countries. The, the green countries are producing excedents, while the, the red countries are importing large amounts of proteins from other parts of the world. In fact, if you see the trajectory of the world since 70 years, since 1960, about, that's the beginning of the FAO statistics, that, that's why <laughs> I use this date. Uh, when, you, when you look at, at the, this trajectory, you see that the rate of circulation of nitrogen through the agro-food system has increased enormously, uh, a factor of three for agricultural production. Uh, you see also that this increase has been accompanied by an increase of total trade, as I showed you, and a tremendous increase also of nitrogen losses to the environment. And you see this trajectory, uh, which is a little scaring, really. Now, we are speaking of scenarios of what will happen in the next uh, 30 years. Most conventional prospective work predicts this kind of continuation of the scenario. This point would be the continuation of the, tr the current trends at the horizon 2050 with continuation of conventional agriculture, depending a lot on Haber Brush industrial uh, fertilizers, continuing with the disparities existing between the, uh, among the, the different diet of the population, and uh, also continuing with this trend of specialization of the territorial agro-food system, because this is in fact part of the liberal dogma uh, you, you remember Ricardo, free trade between specialized regions is always more profitable than self-sufficiency. That's the, the liberal dogma, in fact. So uh, the trend toward specialization uh, leads to this increase of trade and also this increase of uh, nitrogen losses. The fact that uh, synthetic industrial fertilizers are absolutely required, particularly because we have to feed to 2 billion habitants in the planet. And that's always the argument that you, you can hear. Uh, the fact that uh, these fertilizers are necessary is very much uh, in the mind of the mainstream thinking. Uh, just have a look to this picture which I took from our world in data. You know this, this uh, very good, by the way, uh, website where you can find lots of uh, global data. And this is an article about uh, the world population which is depending on synthetic fertilizer, Haberbosch fertilizer, for their feeding. Okay. From, uh, th that's the evolution of this number since the invention of the uh, Haber-Bosch process. This is the total world population and this is the, the estimates of the, pop the part of the share of the, pop the global population depending on fertilizer. Today, about half the global population is depending on Haber-Bosch uh, fertilizers. Okay, that's a matter of fact. But what is interesting here is the interpretation the authors of these studies are providing. They, 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 they wrote, Fritz Haber and Karl Bosch, the pioneers of this technological breakthrough, are estimated to have enabled the lives of several billion people who otherwise would have died. Okay, 
Haber and Bosch present it as saviors of the humanity. That's, that's, that's fantastic. And that's, that's a strange reasoning because, of course, if <laughs> the Haber-Bosch process would not have been invented, well, those people would not have died. Uh, maybe they, 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 okay, what would have happened is that agronomy would have <laughs> developed quite different ways of fertilizing uh, agriculture. Uh, but these people would certainly not have died. The world would have been quite different, that's, that's for sure. But uh, there is no billion person uh, dying because of, of, of that, okay, in this scenario. Because, okay, uh, it is like if there is absolutely no alternatives to uh, synthetic fertilizer. And I will show that there are alternatives. And so, yes, I, I will show you that by operating three levers, three levers of change, we can we can design alternative agrofood systems. The first lever of change is to generalize agroecological cropping systems. I will explain you uh, what, is, what that is. The second lever is to reconnect crop and livestock farming system. So, despecializing agrofood system. And the third lever is to take action on the diet, and in particular, reducing the amount of animal-based proteins in human diet. Agroecological uh, farming systems. What does that mean? Well, th this is a typical conventional chemical uh, farming system. You know, crops are not grown every year on the same field. There is an alternation on the same field from year to year. Uh, here, for instance, uh, you have uh, rapeseed. Sorry for the French here. I forgot to, to change that. Uh, rapeseed. rapeseed is cultivated. It is the head of the rotation one year with lots of uh, fertilizers, synthetic fertilizer put in in the beginning. Uh, this is in winter. Uh, at the end of, uh, in the beginning of the winter, uh, wheat is sown. It receives three applications of uh, fertilizers. Uh, it is harvested in uh, summer. And, and then uh, the last, the, the following year, uh, barley is grown up. And then again, okay. That, that's a typical short rotation system in conventional agriculture. In organic farming, you have much longer rotations. With, uh, in the beginning the head, in, in the beginning of the, the cycle, you grow two or three years of alfalfa, for instance, or clover. A legume, a nitrogen-fixing legume, a forage legume, which in fact prepare the soil. Prepare the soil by putting in this soil lots of nitrogen coming from uh, nitrogen fixation. So that after these two or three years, you can uh, sow wheat, which is which find an environment very rich in nitrogen. You don't need any inputs of synthetic fertilizer because uh, nitrogen has already been provided to the soil. You can even have a second cereal after that, uh, the, the year after, treaty kale, for instance. Then you will, you will sow a less demanding, less nitrogen demanding plant like flax. And then again, a legume as lentils, for instance. Lentils is again fixing nitrogen for the, the next crop, which is again a wheat and barley, for instance, as a last stop. And then you come back with alfalfa. This is quite efficient because you, uh, it provides enough nitrogen to the plant for uh, uh, getting rid of the need for industrial fertilizers. Also, the diversity of 
the, of the plants, which come back only every 10 years or 9 or 10 years again to the soil, uh, uh, makes that th there is much lower risk of diseases or uh, pests. So you can also avoid uh, the use of pesticides in this system. That's what I meant by agroecological uh, cropping systems. And these exist in, agri in biological agriculture everywhere in Europe uh, under different forms. I, I will not enter the details here. Uh, it is, is, this exists also in Africa uh, with leguminous shrubs or trees used as nitrogen fixer. You will often hear that organic farming is much less productive uh, than conventional farming. That organic farming has an intrinsic yield gap of about 20 to 30 percent. <coughs> but this is because uh, th this results from observation crop by crop, crop species by crop species. If you look at the yield fertilization relationship at full rotational level, uh, you will see a quite different uh, picture. Oh, I should have. <laughs> um, let me take an example, the, the example of what is called the petite terre, the small, uh, small grounds of Burgundy in Bourgogne. In the 1950s, agriculture was not using a lot of synthetic fertilizer. And in this region, uh, the crop rotation used generally was uh, clover, wheat, oats. With as only nitrogen, fertilizing nitrogen input, what clover can fix. And the yield was, the mean yield at the scale of the three-year rotation was rather low. In to, today, the most oh, sorry, choop, choop, well, the most uh, con the, the most frequent uh, conventional agriculture rotation is this famous rape wheat barley uh, crop rotation that I that I showed you already, which much more input of nitrogen and much more yield. Okay. Um, organic farming systems, like the, the one I just showed you, are described here. So they have an intermediate average nitrogen input and an intermediate uh, ni uh, yield in terms of nitrogen. Okay, you can even have other systems with higher level of fertilization and higher and higher uh, yields. But you see that all these systems obey the same crop yield fertilization relationship. A kind of hyperbolic curve which uh, goes to an asymptote that is between 300, about 300 kilograms nitrogen per hectare and per year. All of these systems, whatever organic or uh, conventional, obeys the same relationship. So if organic farming is less productive, it is just because it is less intensive, because the inputs of nitrogen are lower. And that's an advantage because that means that uh, the losses of nitrogen are much lower in the less intensive system. So that is the perspective from which you have to discuss this question of yield gap, in fact. It is, in fact, a question of intensity. Uh, this the kind, the same kind of observation can, can be done everywhere in Europe, and you, you see the distribution of this famous Ymax uh, parameter of the crop uh, yield uh, nitrogen input relationship. Okay, so you see that there are... Uh, so, sorry, yes? Is it 
where does the nitrogen go? Like which loss are we taking? It is lost to the atmosphere okay. or to the hydrosphere. Okay. Both. Yeah. Okay. But uh, it is the nitrogen that you put as fertilizer that you don't find back in the harvest. So it is lost. Yeah. I cannot say precisely uh, where it is, but it is somewhere in the environment with deleterious effects. Okay. Um, okay. So that's was my, my first lever. My second lever is this question of reconnecting livestock and cropping system in order to avoid a long distance trade of feed. I don't want that anymore. That means that livestock should ha be calibrated in, in, in abundance in its population to the availability of local resources of feed for ruminants cows, uh, sheep, etc. Uh, that is locally produced grass and fodder legumes for uh, monogastrics, that is uh, pigs and uh, poultry. Uh, that means grain in excess of, uh, of uh, human needs or spill of human cons uh, uh, consumption and so on. Just to, to see you what I mean by this reconnection. Let me take another example. Uh, uh, Milk-oriented mixed crop livestock farming system in Brie. The Brie laitière. Uh, but the Brie is the region east of Paris, not far from here, uh, where the Brie cheese was produced traditionally. Uh, you know that. Uh, well, how did this system work? But like, like that, with very few synthetic fertilizer, or a little bit, but mostly uh, symbiotic fixation because the, the uh, crop rotation was typically alfalfa, wheat, beet, uh, and another uh, secondary cereal. Okay. But there were also a, a very important area of permanent grassland where livestock, was, uh, dairy livestock, was producing meat and milk and fed partly from the grassland and partly from uh, the uh, crops here. So uh, now this region of France has been completely drained. The, the wet grasslands that were uh, the, the reason why there were so many milking cows. These wet grasslands were drained, till drained, so that you could grow up uh, wheat. You could cultivate cereals in there on the old surface. And in this region you always see cereals, cereals, maize, cereals, maize which is exported as cash crops. That's the simple system replacing now this traditional system with huge imports, huge use of synthetic fertilizer. Yet in this region, I studied a few organic farms, uh, which in fact use this famous long and diversified crop rotation that I just explained to you, producing cash crop production of cereals, lentils, and things like that, but also huge amount of alfalfa. And what is the outlet of alfalfa? We are not eating alfalfa. So alfalfa has to be exported far away uh, for deshydrating dis dis it uh, in, in some uh, plants uh, to, to send it far away uh, where, where livestock is needing it. But there is no local outlet for this alfalfa, and that's, of course, uh, a problem. So the, the problem, but the solution is simple. You reintroduce milking cows <laughs> in the region, and you have a fantastic outlet for your alfalfa. And you have a complete system producing cereals, cash crop, in about a comparable amount of what conventional agriculture farm, but in addition, you produce wonderful brie cheese from brie, because today the brie cheese is not produced from in brie because there are no, no cows there. It is uh, produced uh, far away in the east of France. Okay, so you, you see what I meant by reconnecting a livestock, a crop and livestock farming. My third lever, and then I finished. My third lever is to reconsider the human diet. When you look at the, the evolution since 
the middle of the 19th century, of um, the human diet. But you see what I showed you. To, today we are here with 65% animal-based protein. The, the, the red one is animal product. Uh, and, and only 35% of uh, vegetal-based proteins, which was not at all the case uh, earlier. The, the biggest change came during the, uh, the glorious 30s. And this is not without uh, public health problems. Several diseases, uh, health diseases, uh, diabetes, obesity, are linked to this change of diet. The Lancet, the Eat Lancet Commission, that's a group of uh, médecins, uh, doctors, doctors yeah. uh, they, they, produ they, they produce a proposition for a healthy diet which would be sustainable for all the inhabitants of the planet. That, that's how it looks at. And I just translate it in terms of nitrogen, in terms of proteins, that, that is uh, their uh, proposition, with about 30% of animal-based protein instead of... Uh, well, that, that's a reduction by a factor two of the share of animal products in the diet. Okay? So, combining these three levers, yes? Uh, yes, these are grams per day uh, in the in the Eat Lancet proposition. Uh, my, my figure are in kilogram per year. That's that's why uh, and in nitrogen. Okay. Now combining these three lever, I redesign the agro food system of Europe at the regional level. And that's the results, compared with the reference that I showed you in detail at the beginning of my talk. What you see is, well, by construction, we get rid of synthetic fertilizer. No more synthetic fertilizer. We get rid of imported feed, because we calibrate livestock on the resources existing from permanent grassland and uh, permanent glassland, which has not changed in area, and cropland, which has not changed in area. I, keep, I kept constant the agricultural area. But I calibrate the livestock on the basis of the resources that, which exist locally for them. And you see that Europe, the, the, system, the agricultural system, is able to feed the European population, which, by the way, didn't change a lot uh, during this period. Uh, the population can be, can be uh, fed. There are exceedance which can be exported to outside Europe, so Europe continues to provide food for continents which would need it, but it's no more dependent on uh, the rest of the world for both fertilizers and feed imports. So that's the way. And also what you see is that I pro uh, this implies no more specialization into either livestock oriented or crop oriented regions. All regions are now as uh, yes, the color is not very. In fact, this is orange. Huh? This is fodder based mixed uh, systems. Yes. Can I ask two questions here? Yes. Because you have projection 20, 2050. My first question would be economic. So what about the, as far as I remember, if correct me if I'm wrong, that European, in European Union, the agriculture is subsidized. So is it the case by 2050 as well? And the second question is you mentioned um, fertilizer, but usually the excessive practice of nitrogen that you mentioned and phosphorus, the uh, disturbing the climate as, as well. So how would you comment on this, on this too? Well, how would you comment? On that's just the end of my 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 talk. So I continue, and I will answer it. <laughs> uh, okay. So wh what I what I showed is that as a biogeochemically, 
another, uh, another system, an alternative system is feasible from the biogeochemical point of view, which is only one aspect of the question. I, I completely agree, but it is possible. What I sh can show also, and that, that is this slide, uh, the system would use much, this is the reference, this is the agroecological scenario, the system would use much less resources, because the, uh, what I call resources here is the fertilizers, the symbiotic, fix, ferti, the symbiotic fixation, and the food and feed imports. Okay, uh, this disappear and we use no, uh, this disappear and we use no more fertilizer. So we use much less resources. And we are producing a little less products. And the waste, these losses of nitrogen, to the atmosphere, and these are the responsible for, well, they are na namely the responsible for climate change. These uh, wastes are reduced by a factor of three. About. Okay, so that's what I can show. Uh, this alternative system is feasible and is better for the environment, including for climate change. No. Yeah. <laughs> question. Um, so the reduction in overall food consumption yeah. is due to the fact that at the moment we consume too much per yeah, person. Exactly. That's because I, I assumed, because population didn't change significantly, I assumed a lower total intake of protein. Mm -hmm. I also assumed a much lower part share of animal products in this total, but I also consider a, a reduce uh, uh, a reduction of total nitrogen intake mm -hmm. okay. in the scenario. And that, that's why uh, you have this, this uh, pink uh, bar a little smaller. Okay, okay well, I, I just finish. Uh, oh, okay, for uh, greenhouse gas emission, that, that's the total, you see also a strong reduction. Uh, just, just uh, that was for Europe. I can to, to do the same little more fine, in less details, but I, I do the same for the, these famous 12 regions of the world. Uh, you see here the global orchestration, that, that was a, a mainstream thinking uh, scenario that I explained to you uh, just before. This would be this agroecological scenario that I call here the equitable diet scenario, because I consider 30% animal proteins and this this diet can be shared to all the inhabitants of the planet, which would not have been the case for a much more animal-based, product-rich uh, uh, diet, huh? which is considered in rich countries in the red scenario. Uh, okay, so you see that with this scenario would have, a, at the global scale, a significant reduction of nitrogen loss and a significant reduction of total trade, international trade of uh, agricultural commodities. If you need to, if you wished to reach the total self-sufficiency of each of these 12 parts of the world, you would have to reduce the animal-based protein share in the diet to 20%. But then you could have a scenario which zero total trade and half the losses of nitrogen that you are uh, now experiencing. That's the result of this biogeochemical scenario. Now, how to reach that? <laughs> how to reach that that's, that's uh, designed scenario, de that scenario designed by, in the mind of uh, biogeochemist of foolish biogeochemist. <laughs> how, how to reach that is not an answer that I can give you from a biogeochemical perspective, of course, uh, but there are pistes of that. Uh, the, the, important is, the important thing is that another world is possible, says, says these people. What for? Answer the rich man. That's all. <laughs>